My name's Phil Quinlan, the director of the UK CRC Tissue Directory and Coordination Centre. Uh, we are the UK's national centre for biobanking and obviously in biobanking activity. Um, a biobank, um, in its broadest definition, is the storage of anything biological, so the biological material. It can be, for example, storing uh, DNA from an uh, endangered species, it can be storing plants, but in this context it's about storing material from people that can, many, can then be used in medical research. Funding for biobanks is quite varied. Uh, it used to be you got a, a large single pot of money from either a research council which are supported by government funding or a research charity that's investing in a particular area. So you used to get these one large grants uh, that would support all your activity. Uh, more recently, uh, that's shifting slightly, so it's becoming more of a cost recovery model. So biobanks, when they're used by a researcher, will ask the researcher to make a contribution to their costs, and so they get money as people use them. So there's a, there's a, there's a slight shift at the moment, um, but predominantly it's still via large single grants. Historically, the challenge has been actually how do you get material from people? So how do you ask their consent, how do you ask their permission to actually take the samples? Uh, and that's where a lot of the effort was initially. It's important um, now that they are used because that's how they get their funding. So um, if, if they are being used, that means they can bring in income from researchers to cover their costs. Biobanks are, are kind of a un, relatively unknown, um, but almost vital part of medical research. It is hard to imagine any human medical research that hasn't involved at any point a human sample. So without human samples and without the biobanks that hold those samples, you can't really envisage human medical research happening. It's just a vital part of that process. A researcher coming to, to a biobank will have their own particular research interest. Uh, that interest can be very broad, um, and so the questions that a biobank are asked are very individual for that particular research project. And they change over time. So if we go back 10, 15 years and think about what was understood about, for example, breast cancer, it was still quite a naive diagnosis, as in they knew cancer was in the breast, but that was a pretty much it. As time develops and knowledge develops, we need to know more. So within breast cancer now, there's, there's various different subtypes of breast cancer, but there's also things like, did the person smoke? What was their alcohol? Did they have children? How many children did they breastfeed? Because all these things affect the biology of a person, which could affect the cancer. So the amount of information the researcher requires about the people that have donated the sample is increasing as we know and learn more about uh, medical research. You'll hear more about consent uh, during the workshop and it's a really challenging area. So consent for samples has traditionally been very generic in the sense of you'll, you'll donate a sample on the basis that that will be required for medical research. But at that point in time, they don't know exactly what medical research will happen. Most samples will be used maybe two, five, 10, 15, 50 years later after the sample was donated. Then the researcher will come in and ask for that data. How do you compare the consent that was given 10, 20 years ago with the current attitudes towards data, data sharing now? And that's the challenge. How do you reconcile the consent that was taken many, many years ago with current research needs? So at the moment, a lot of, a lot of the challenge is actually in how do biobanks get the data? So a biobank will on the behalf of the researcher trying to link the data sets up to provide the researcher with a data set they can analyse but without knowing the identity of the person. The challenge there is that people that have those data sets, for example the NHS or your GP, might be very cautious about releasing that data to a biobank if they're not convinced the consent is correct, especially if that consent was taken 15, 20 years ago. So it doesn't solve everything. Um, but it does at least get to the point where data could be shared. So if we can get the consent right, that will allow data to be shared in a way that both is sensible and comfortable for the person that made the donation, but also is for the people that have the data sets, they're comfortable that they're allowed to and it's safe to and it's appropriate to release that information. Then that creates an environment where you've got the samples with the data and then the research can happen.
So we are worried uh, as a national centre about what could happen. Um, particularly, as I said, biobanks often get their funding now from researchers using the biobank. As research increases and the knowledge increases, the data requirements increase. So if, if biobanks cannot provide the data that researchers require, researchers won't use the biobank. If researchers don't use the biobank, they can't recover their costs. So there's a risk, and it's, it's, a, it's an unknown risk because we don't know what will happen, but what happens if the biobank can no longer operate and it can't store those samples because there's no funding in place? And that's what we're worried about. And for the UK, it's obviously very important currently that we have a strong research environment where researchers can thrive and be able to do this type of research. And if we don't have our own biobanks, what do we do?